Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Caroline Lewis. And me, Matt Skinner. The readings for July 10th, 2022, the fifth Sunday after Pentecost, are Deuteronomy 30, verses 9 through 14. The alternative first reading would be Amos chapter 7, verses 7 through 17. Our psalm is number 25, verses 1 through 10. And our second reading is from Colossians chapter 1, verses 1 through 14. And the gospel this week will be Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37. The Good Samaritan. Familiar, familiar text. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it's it's always that's always a challenge, right? And the commentary talks about that, the u- ubiquity of of this story, and uh, and so how do you you know what what do you do with it? I uh, I often will suggest to my my beginning preachers, but also just preachers in general, that when you do have a a familiar story like this, maybe one first step is to rename the parable, rename the story. It's called the Good Samaritan. Uh, I always find it so interesting that the word good never appears in the parable. So what exactly makes him good? Uh, and I, that's, a, that, that's always, a, I think, an important inquiry. But what would you title it? Uh, what, what title would you give it? Uh, who is my neighbor? Uh, uh, yeah. How did I, I, Jesus. What's that? How to test Jesus. Oh, how to test Jesus. Yeah. I mean, it winds up, it's always, we're the ones that are tested by who is my neighbor. But we miss the fact that this wasn't a disciple trying to get his life together. This was a critic trying to trap Jesus. Mm -hmm. And that title uh, can at least keep that in our imagination or keep that in the imagination of the listeners. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So anyway, that's my first thought. Give it a new title. <laughs> see what happens. Yeah. Or just really unpack, you know, um, or unpack the title that's given. I mean, what what makes him good? And the commentary uh, does a nice job with that. That it's uh, it, that you know that go and do likewise. This is it's about it. it the the you know, the priest and the Levite do nothing. Uh, and when they see this human being in need. And so uh, what is that, you know, go and do likewise, that doing that. And one of the things that such an interesting contrast, because immediately after this story, of course, is the story of Mary and Martha, mm-hmm. where the hearing is, <laughs> you know, the hearing is uplifted, but it's not one of, they're not mutually exclusive. There's one, it, and that that's kind of a, that's kind of an interesting juxtaposition as well in terms of where this story is located. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's um, it's a it's a parable that I mean, all the parables have traps that, right, that lead you towards some kind of self justifying <laughs> perspective, or that potential for that and how we read them. But so much of this story, I think, is proven to be a trap. Jesus is not a Protestant in <laughs> this story, like. I think he's partly saying the law tells you everything you need to know. You want to know how to find eternal life, go and do the law. And, but then, you know, the history of interpretation has been so much of trying to find a way to vilify the priest and the Levite is to suggest that, you know, Mm -hmm. this is all about self-justification or the law really, if you keep the law, it really will lead you to mistreat your neighbor, which I think are all bad readings. Um, Amy Jo Levine has done great work on this parable, but there is, you have to keep in mind what, what you were saying, Joy, is that the, the the lawyer is not a good faith actor here. Mm-hmm. Luke makes that quite clear. Mm-hmm. And um, so part of what's going on, I think what Jesus is pushing back against is somebody who knows the things to say, knows aspects of the law, but won't put it into practice mm-hmm. or won't put it in practice the right way. So that who's my neighbor thing, you know what I mean? You love your neighbor as yourself. Well, if the guy had kept reading in Leviticus 19, he would know that later on in Leviticus 19, it says, you shall love the alien as yourself, right? It's not, so even what he's doing here, 
in terms of trying to like, what's the word I want to confine the notion of neighbor mm -hmm. isn't even true to the exact same chapter he's working out of in Leviticus here, which is, mm -hmm. you know, be funny if Jesus had brought that up, but that doesn't, <laughs> doesn't turn into a Bible study. But then how the story, you know, plays that out just to kind of collapse this whole distinction you would want to draw between neighbor, insider, outsider, friend, enemy, person I don't care about, um, which of course is a brilliant story, the way it's told and the way Jesus turns it at the end in terms of, you know, who acted as a neighbor. And, mm -hmm. um, but we, I think we mentioned this last week talking about Naaman. This is the one where everybody knows the third character is going to be the hero. And the first word out of Jesus' mouth, at least in the Greek of, of Luke, is Samaritan. <laughs> and you just <laughs> can imagine the crowd going, no, what a terrible story. <laughs> This is and the worst. The, yeah. the, pow the power of the story, but I, I want to highlight something you just said, Matt, because I, I don't want our listeners to miss it, is that the, the law that is rehearsed here is the act. And when he gives the right answer, when the lawyer gives the right answer, uh, he asks the question, well, before I get into the action, let, let's define who I have to practice this among. And the twist of the story is that Jesus is describing what the action looks like throughout the entire story. That's For me, that's the brilliance of how this is narrated because it's the description of what the law calls for. Yep, yeah. And, and that's- You gotta learn it from the Samaritan. Then you go. Uh, and that- <laughs> And that, and that description is so important. And, you know, in verse 36, what Jesus doesn't say, which of these three, um, it's, uh, you know, who, but was a neighbor. Mm -hmm. So that focus on the action. And then it, when you go back and realize, oh, this is focusing on, you know, the action, right? Not the identity, but how that was acted out, then you go back and you look at all of the things that 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 are that are narrated, right? As you said, Joy, in the in the parable. And so which kind of goes back to like my question of what makes the Samaritan good, right? Which, you know, again is not in the parable, but uh, but but when but the Samaritan while traveling, that that first act of coming near. Mm -hmm. And then seeing and going back to that larger theme in Luke of do we see as Jesus sees? Do we see as God sees? What is our perspective? Uh, are, do we, and, and that, that repetition of that verb in Luke, you know, Jesus saw the widow of Nain. Jesus saw Zacchaeus up in the tree and and then was moved with pity and he went to him and bandaged his wounds and poured oil and wine on them put him on his donkey or animal brought him to an inn and took care of him and then so that you just then you go wait what 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 did he do as a neighbor again oh <laughs> this lengthy list of actions uh really then highlight that the activity the doing and not the identity. And Caroline, you know I love that you weave together all of the different encounters throughout Luke. Um, that echoing that is so important for us as we are rehearsing these stories uh, uh, that are the good news, the gospel. Um, whatever has been preached over these last few weeks um, as we're in the midst of this journey, or even if this um, um, has this particular week becomes a detour from talking about the prophets, whatever has been lifted up in terms of hospitality, in terms of welcoming, in terms of, um, of going beyond um, the categories of our society, I'm, I'm thinking back to Galatians, those can be echoed as you are preparing, uh, as you are preaching this particular sermon. So think about what you've said in the last few weeks of preaching and mm -hmm. echo that in this sermon as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's, um, 
I've been thinking about this text mostly because I, I taught it in my Luke class just a couple of weeks ago. And the um, a lot of interpreters mention Martin Luther King Jr.'s interpretation of the parable, which he spends a little bit of time on this from his, his last speech, actually the night before he was murdered. Um, I've been to the mountaintop is how it's usually titled and in, in, in index if you want to read it. And it's toward the end, but he says the you know the problem of the first two characters is that they couldn't get over the question of um, if I stop to help this man, what's going to happen to me? Because mm -hmm. this is a dangerous spot. And he said what makes the Samaritan different is he says um, if I don't stop to help this man, what's going to happen to him? Mm -hmm. And which is I think a, a great way of you know, we we can't help but try to ascribe motives to the three characters. I think that's a really great way of of breaking this apart that saying that the first two their problem wasn't that they were jewish it's the problem is that they should have known better <laughs> they should, these are the people you would expect to know how to do good to somebody else but i would also want to even push back or not push back but extend what king says one more step and say another way we might think about this is if i don't help this man what's going to happen to me right in other words what's the cost to my own well-being mm. if i just let this person mm -hmm die there you know what i mean and so it makes me think of I, i've also been teaching uh another class recently where we're reading james baldwin and one of baldwin's big things was it's actually in the self-interest of american whites to pursue racial reconciliation i mean his whole mindset is built on, on around self-interest it's to everybody's benefit right and robert jones has a book where he makes a, a very similar argument about the church right that this is so to help people think about that, that, that the good Samaritan, so-called good Samaritan, isn't just isn't modeling like necessarily self-sacrificial behavior. He's modeling a kind of community. And maybe he's modeling the kind of world he wants to live in. Yeah. Should the positions be reversed? You know, I mean, we we often paint this as you got to be willing to be uncomfortable. You got to be willing to give away all your money. You got to be willing to hurt so that somebody else can heal. And mm -hmm. And there's a truth to that, but there's also something that about what if this is like the Samaritan's best day ever because <laughs> he's living into a new reality that he yeah. believes in mm -hmm. and he knows it's going to come back and somehow accrue to his own spiritual well-being. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. I don't know. That's the sermon I'm working on with this text in my head. At least. Yeah. I like Sorry that. for the long interlude there. No, that's great. I yeah. like that. Wonderful. Yeah. yeah. Anything we want to say about, uh, well, why do it? I mean, Deuteronomy is paired with this. I was just going to ask that. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, I think it's the law leads to life, which is, yeah. again, right. not something that we Protestants are used to saying, but it's, but Jesus says it in the synoptics and, and the law says it quite a bit that there's this right. idea that, that, yeah, that the law is not some distant thing that you have to go on some radical journey to discover it's near to you. And if you could mm -hmm. and not put it into practice to earn God's favor, I'm not saying that it can, can be perfectly kept and, you know, Paul's criticism still holds in a lot of ways, but yeah, this is where the source of life is because God has shown you not just what God wants, but God has shown you what's good for you. Right. Right. And for your neighbor. Exactly. Right? For the sake of the, for the sake of the other as well, for the sake of community. Uh, I like I like the proximity language here. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, there's a concreteness to it in verse 12. Um, well, it, throughout the whole of it, you know, it's not across the sea, um, but but it's not in the sky by and by where you have to ask who's going to go. Um, but it's right. It's right here. It's near. I I. I, I love that. And I think that's consistent with things that we've talked about uh, in, in prior weeks as we've been um, uh, on this journey uh, with these texts um, in, in this podcast. So I appreciate uh, your responding in that way, Matt. I, I, I can live with De Deuteronomy now. Well, yeah. And it, it, the word, yeah, that word is very, this is verse 14. The word is very near to you. It is in your mouth and in your heart uh, to observe. And so it, it really is this, and um, I use this word a lot, but it's, it, you're embodying, uh, the, the Samaritan is embodying this law, right? He's, 
Uh, and and it's kind of an interesting connection too, in terms of when he, you know, he when he sees the man uh, in the ditch, uh, and he was moved with pity is the is the translation. But it, you know, that's that he had compassion for them. That's that um, verb, you know, splognizomai in your gut. And uh, your guts are actually <laughs> feeling it. And so I think there, you know, with, with that and the Deuteronomy passage of that uh, uh, in your mouth and in your heart, uh, it's there <laughs> and, um, and you're acting it out from your very being, uh, not for the sake of, of reward or grace, but uh, you know, to use a Lutheran quote, you cannot do otherwise, right? You just, uh, these works or these ways of being in the world flow, he says, flow out of heat, uh, flow out of heat, uh, flow out. Um, what is, what am I trying to say? Uh, that works flow out of faith as heat does from fire yeah. is as in his preface to the Romans. Mm -hmm. uh, and so it's that helping people get a sense of that, that it's an, it's, you cannot not do it <laughs> in a way. I, you know, I lingered on verse 12. I had highlighted that. And as you were, as you were speaking, I looked back at 11 and um, boy, the, does that line up now with what we were talking about with uh, um, the lawyer uh, quoting the, the, the commandments and this being the response. This isn't too hard for you to do. Yeah, right, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> Not too hard, not too far away. It's right not there, too far away, right? Right there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Not on the top shelf. <laughs> right, right. All right, well, now we move into Amos. So we've been working along with our prophets. We've got two Sundays of Amos. Then we have two Sundays of Hosea. Then we have two Sundays of Isaiah. And then as far as I can tell, lots of Jeremiah. I didn't go, <clears throat> I didn't count them all out, but there's and more. If Rolf were here, what would he say about Amos? If what you would like, he, he would say, if you like Amos, there's something wrong with you. You don't understand Amos. Oh, you don't understand. Amos. <laughs> it's one of his teachers that he likes to quote. Yeah. 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 If you like Amos, if Amos somehow makes you feel good, you probably have misunderstood. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Amos does not like bad religion. You think? Yeah. Okay. Well, nobody in the Bible does. Jesus sure doesn't either. But yeah. Yeah. But Amos is. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. This, I mean, the plumb line is, you know, this in, all questions about how to in, how to translate what in the world that's going on, but whatever the judgment is. But it's the after part of that, right? Where you see Amaziah doing all he can to protect his position, mm -hmm. right? His proximity to the king and uh, um, this 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 intertwining of what we would call religious and political power, which are not that discernible in the ancient world of course but mm -hmm. um and i and remember um, you know amos is an outsider he's not he's not from israel he's not he got called to the north he'd rather be out with the sycamore trees and doing you know i was living a perfectly fine life mm -hmm. before god called me to this mm -hmm. um but yeah it's the way we close ranks it's the way that the, the prophetic word from outside is um always resisted mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yep a few weeks ago, um, when we were getting excited about uh, the fruits of the spirit, um, I had mentioned that if we were to allow that to be the backdrop for how we uh, talk about the prophets, if we were making this a summer of the prophets, um, in one way that plumb line becomes this um, uh, the fruit of the of the spirit, and 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 what does good practice, good religion look like. Uh, and that, that might be another way to keep that echoing of the, the fruit of the spirit as being um, what is that, that, that um, marker for uh, the tangible marker for being uh, on target with uh, the behaviors that would be a demonstration of God's presence. Yeah, uh, I think that that's good, Joy. I mean, it, it, to kind of, build that metaphor a little bit, re recognizing the complexity and the, com the, the commentary talks about that, you know, and, that how, does. and how, how that gets translated, but it, it is a kind of uh, measuring stick, if you will. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, 
you know, we we talk about the canon, that it's a scriptural canon. Well, canon in Greek means measuring stick. That there, what are those, what what are those, uh, what are those measuring tools by which we uh, adjudicate uh, all kinds of things about our faith and God's presence and such. And so it could be a it could be an invitation into that uh, that kind of um, reflection on what those are and um, and when and how do they get skewed and why and yeah. And the places in which if the government is supposed to take care of the people and we place our hope in the government, then measuring it against God's good is mm -hmm. again setting that plumb line and saying, this is why uh, accepting political power falls short of the promises of God. Mm -hmm. I could, I could do with taking away the last two verses i'll just say not because you know well yeah i just yep agreed they're problematic anyway first yeah psalm 25 well that's uh here we're getting some of that same language right uh, uh lead me in your truth and teach me for you uh make me to know your ways i mean there, there's sort of a plea here uh in uh to what is that measurement or what is that way in which I'm um, following? What is that? Where is that law? Help me to do that. And so it, it functions again in a kind of liturgical way, but it functions as a really, it could function really in a, I think a meaningful way for people. If that's the direction that your sermon goes, it's like, where do we have language to help us with? Let's pray this together that we are, that we're attentive to that, uh, to what to what kind of embodiment this law is yeah. calling us, mm -hmm. and to help people see if, especially if you're working in Isaiah in um, in um, Luke ten or in Deuteronomy 30, thirty, that yeah, Torah is not law in the sense of statute, but more in the sense of teaching. Right, and you know, teaching, and which I think you can't, you cannot remind people too often exactly of that and how the law is perceived as. Well, now I'm going to jump to Calvin and not to a Jewish perspective. I believe Calvin talked about the law as being where you can get a glimpse of God's own heart. I'm, I'm paraphrasing wildly there, but mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not so much a how, do, what am I supposed to do document as much as it's a who is this God that we're following kind of a document. Mm -hmm. Exactly. What is this God but, and what is this, what is this God teaching us about exactly. that, how to follow God and, and be in community? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's, you're right. And they're, we don't, we can't say that enough. <laughs> uh, so that the law doesn't get misconstrued and negativized, right? Or weaponized, right? Yep. Or weaponized. weaponized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Exactly. Colossians, we have four Sundays in Colossians. Lucky us. I would, I want to correct you and say we have four weeks on Colossians one through three. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, yes. It does skip, yeah. We the lectionary does spare us some of the more challenging parts, but yes, yes. yes. But we have four weeks in a row. <laughs> True that. Portions of Colossians. There we are. There and we here are. we have the opening. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, the in the in the commentary talks about this, uh, but it, you know, Colossians, regardless of uh, who wrote it and whatever, uh, it, it Colossians and Ephesians together really do offer a, a different kind of Christology. And that's one of the things that I, uh, I often will, enjoy knows this, often will talk about in my, in my preaching class, like are, are, are preachers attentive to the breadth of Christologies that are presented in, in the New Testament? And, uh, and not only, of course, the portraits of Jesus, but uh, but the letters of Paul and then Revelation. I mean, the the way in which uh, the meaning and the purpose of Christ gets worked out in really kinds of uh, well, really unique, particular ways, uh, depending on the context. And so that's I think it's not only then it's both an invitation then for people to think that out like what is your Christology like what what portrait of Jesus do you hang on not just the gospel portrait but 
but also what it, is this an this has become an invitation to see the act the act the activity and the presence and the purpose of Christ in a different way that you maybe haven't thought about before. That's what I think is the benefit of of preaching uh, preaching these texts, especially have if you haven't done it in a while, and to uh, because there you know I I tell my students that you need to do a sermon inventory every year, and go back and read read your sermons and. Uh, which could be a painful reality. So maybe you want a, you know, a glass of wine or more, or a, a beer or a pint of Ben and Jerry's or something to get help you get through it. But, uh, but the point of that is to recognize in our own theological constructs: Do we even preach the same Jesus, even though we have different texts? And how are we being truthful to the scriptural witness about? Uh, about who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. When we were talking earlier about uh, 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 the quote from uh, Luther in terms of um, what is the result of the encounter uh, uh, of Jesus um, and, and how that is lived out in your lives. Um, if, if you're going to take these uh, next uh, four weeks and go through um, uh, Colossians, this first chapter, this opening is an invitation to remember the congregation, um, the community that these words are being spoken to, uh, mm -hmm. the community that is being introduced to this Christ. And um, so if, if, in your inventory, you decide you want to do these four weeks. Um, I would I would say begin by lingering in paying attention first to the people to whom this is being addressed mm -hmm. and why they are being lifted up the way that they're being lifted up, who they were, what their encounter with Christ has um, produced in them as a community, and then focus on who this Christ is mm -hmm. that once encountered has made this kind of impact in their lives. It makes this not so much about law and about rules, but about a community who are is receiving a word from a pastor who is speaking to them in the moment that they are living. Mm -hmm. Well, and who's trying to pull them back from making assumptions about their own spirituality that could prove either harmful to them or discouraging in some ways, you know, so it's mm -hmm. all of the elevated Christology in this book, I think is toward the service of telling people Christ is sufficient mm -hmm. and the experience you've had so far with Christ is sufficient. Don't go seeking greater spiritual blessings or kind of greater levels of achievement, um, which is really a different voice in a book like Galatians does that. But here it's just, don't you know <laughs> where you reside? Don't you know with whom you reside? Don't you know what Christ has done? And so some of that comes out like you were pointing to, I, hit, I think here in verse six, right? It's at the very beginning, right? That you've been bearing fruit. You're growing in the whole world. It's a very encouraging mm -hmm. letter, which can get lost if we come running in with our theological ex excavation kit and want to ask questions of, you know, how, how divine is Jesus? Or, you know, how much is wisdom literature influencing this? I mean, all really good questions that get us excited, but this but is about a pastor saying, you're all good. Yes. And, and there's a moment when that's exactly what we need to be reminded of. 